All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, thanks, everybody, for everybody here in person and uh, everybody logged in virtually as well, um, both from the school and from Penn Vet and Penn Medicine. Um, so thank you for coming to Grasp on Robotics. Uh, I'm Dan Hashimoto. I'm one of the surgeons uh, over at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and uh, just a couple of notes um, that uh, Sadie handed me to make sure I hit. Um, so uh, there are previously recorded talks for the Grasp on Robotics seminars available online on the YouTube channel and on the Grasp website. Uh, and if you're joining us via Zoom, um, please be sure to use the Q&A function if you have any questions um, as they come up. And at the very end of the talk, um, Professor Valdostri is going to answer some questions. And um, uh, uh, Guichu Liao, who's a postdoc in my lab, and Sai Krishik, who's a um, master student in ESE, um, are going to be our panelists who are sort of moderating the Q&A both here and online. Um, and so without much further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to everybody um, Professor Pietro Valdastri. He is Professor of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at the University of Leeds, where he also serves as Chair in Robotics and Autonomous Systems. He's also the Director of the Science and Technologies of Robotics and Medicine Lab, or the STORM Lab, um, there at Leeds, as well as the Director of the Institute of Robotics and Autonomous Systems and Sensing. Um, I can't fit all of his accolades uh, into my one page of my Google Keep notes, um, but to sort of hit the highlights, he is a Wolfson Fellow for the Royal Society, which is one of the oldest scientific societies in the world. Uh, he's also a senior member of the IEEE, um, and he's an editor for medical and rehabilitation robotics for IEEE RAL. Um, and uh, as well as uh, involvement in surgical societies. So he's also a member of the Technology Committee for the European Association of Endoscopic Surgeons, um, which is the largest non-US association of minimally invasive and robotic surgeons in the world. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, we're really looking forward to, to hearing about your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I mean, I've been, I've been to, uh, I was a faculty at Vanderbilt University in Nashville for five years. So I'm very familiar with the US system and I'm really glad to, to be on this side of the pond uh, again. And I travel often here, so. Uh, all right, so um, first of all, I'll start with a few words about Leeds. So it's a question I already got today, actually. <laughs> Where is Leeds? And so uh, Leeds is a city near Manchester. It is quite a, I mean, it's a 1.4 million people uh, in terms of size. It's the main financial center of England outside uh, London. Uh, and it's in the middle of Yorkshire, which is really nice, uh, really nice countryside. It's about two hour uh, fast train ride uh, north of London. So if you are traveling to the UK, please consider visiting. Uh, it's, it's, it's really nice, especially in the summer and hiking is, is really great in Yorkshire. Um, the University of Leeds uh, has uh, one of the biggest teaching hospital in Europe. And so I'm really passionate about uh, uh, medical and surgical robotics. And so when I moved from Vanderbilt uh, to uh, Leeds, uh, that was the main uh, reason. So to have uh, uh, a huge hospital uh, to uh, with, with doctors to collaborate with. I'm located uh, in, uh, in this new building, which is uh, named after Sir William Bragg. Bragg was a Nobel laureate in physics uh, and uh, a professor at the University of Leeds. And this building, uh, my lab is at the fourth floor of this building. So um, if you are uh, in the UK and want to stop by, please let me know. I'll be glad to show our robots. Uh, and so today I'll talk, you, I'll talk about surgical robotics, in particular robotic endoscopes. Uh, but before we go into this, uh, uh, into the, the, the topic of my talk, I would like to highlight this review paper, which uh, I was uh, fortunate to co-author. It was, this was an effort spearheaded by Pierre Dupont and uh, is uh, from Boston. And uh, this is uh, a review paper on science robotics, uh, highlighting uh, the most influential scientific work of the last decade, 2010, 2020. Um, in different fields of medical robotics, from rehabilitation robotics to surgical robotics, um, micro robotics. And my particular task was to curate the 
chapter about capsule robots. Um, in this paper, uh, as in some other papers, actually, we, we discuss different levels of autonomy applied to uh, medical robotics. And so you may be familiar, of course, with automotive uh, and the increasing level of computer assistance uh, in driving a car uh, with self-assisted parking and autonomous driving. There is a very odd research in, uh, uh, in applying different level of computer assistance uh, to surgical and medical robotics, going from no autonomy at all, which is where current surgical robots are, to increasing level of autonomy, up, up to full automation. And today I will use this paradigm to show you some uh, increased level of automation, particularly in robotic colonoscopy, which is uh, one of the platform I'm, I'm developing. Um, but now let's move to uh, uh, the research I'm doing in my lab. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, large activity in robotic endoscopy, in particular on uh, uh, robotic colonoscopy. And this is something I'll tell you about in the first half of my talk. Um, here we use magnetic field to drive uh, a flexible endoscope inside the colon. Um, we also uh, we are also interested in ultra low cost and portable solution for gastric cancer screening, uh, and uh, here we uh, develop a soft uh, robot for uh, uh, the investigation of uh, gastric cancer. Um, we also collaborate with Intuitive and have uh, two and a half Da Vinci robot uh, with the Da Vinci research kit, and there we are in this. Field, we are interested in enhancing uh, imaging, and so we are uh, working on uh, micro ultrasound and terahertz uh, imaging uh, to better identify tumor margin. And we are also interested in automating part of the procedure, like automating uh, tissue retraction, um, for example. And uh, uh, we also work on uh, magnetic catheters. Uh, where, which we call magnetic tentacles, which is a fancier name than magnetic catheters. What, what we are interested in is in the control of the full shape. So not just controlling the tip as existing magnetic catheters, but controlling the full shape. And so today I'll also talk about this in the second half of my uh, presentation. Uh, I won't touch on this topic and uh, uh, on, on the ultra low cost uh, um, uh, gastric cancer screening platform, as well as I will, will not discuss our robotic surgery activities. If you are interested, just please get in touch with me at the end of the talk. Okay, let's start with um, robotic colonoscopy. So why, why colonoscopy is important uh, uh, here in, in the US, I, it's, it's much easier job for me because uh, here, uh, screening happens with colonoscopy. Screening for colorectal cancer happens with colonoscopy. Uh, and so colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death, and is the cancer happening at the end of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is the gastrointestinal tract, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine or colon. Colorectal cancer is the cancer at the, uh, in the colon. Um, so how does colorectal cancer progress? It progresses uh, in five to 10 years from a stage zero. So stage where just removing the tissue uh, would uh, basically uh, make the five year survival rate about 100%. So if cancer is detected at this stage, removed, it doesn't come back. So it's really like, um, a procedure, a, a way to solve the problem. Uh, while if the cancer is left there and grows and grows up to stage four, in that case, surgery is needed uh, as well as chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And in that case, the five-year survival rate drops down to 11% with a much more invasive uh, uh, therapy to, to, to deal with cancer. And so for this reason, it's extremely important to get colorectal cancer as soon as possible. Unfortunately, it's 
uh, early stage colorectal cancer is not symptomatic, so there is no pain, there is no blood in the feces, uh, and so it's very, very difficult to, to find it. And for this reason, um, there are screening programs around the world. In the US, screening is uh, happens with colonoscopy, uh, starting at the age of 45. It was 50 at the starting age until a few years ago, now it's 45. That means that in the US there are about 22 million colonoscopies to be performed every year, which is a huge number. In Europe, uh, unfortunately, we screen with the uh, fecal blood test, which is much less sensitive and it's not really a see and cure kind of procedure. Um, and then if the screen, the, the, the fecal blood test is positive, then we get the colonoscopy. But uh, here is more with, with this instrument. So colonoscopy entails the introduction of a 1.5 meter long uh, flexible endoscope or tube inside the colon. Uh, and so it, this tube has to navigate from the anus all the way to the cecum. Uh, look around with the camera. There is, of course, light to illuminate. There is an irrigation nozzle to clean the camera, but also to insufflate the tissue to create space. Um, and there are cables uh, running through the length of the device to articulate the tip, left, right, up, and down. And those cables are connected to those two knobs here that are, are um, controlled with the thumb of the, uh, of the um, user. And you see here, like a gastroenterologist who is holding the user interface with one hand and with the other hand is pushing and pulling the probe. Uh, there is also an instrument channel and this channel is used to pass uh, conventional instruments, like here it's a biopsy forceps to get tissue samples. And this is a polypectomy loop to remove a polyp, which is a, a precursor of uh, a colorectal cancer. Um, so it is an effective procedure, but it uh, has a lot of drawbacks, uh, colonoscopy. Uh, all those drawbacks are related to the design of the instrument. That you see here, this is a modern Olympus uh, colonoscope, and this is the first flexible endoscope introduced in 1957. Uh, the main difference is in the vision system. So at the time, it was a bundle of optical fibers, so the doctor has to look into the ocular. Nowadays, we have high-definition chip-on-tip camera, um, but the principle of use is still the same. It's still like pushing a tube from the outside of the patient body uh, to navigate a convoluted anatomy. Uh, what is the issue there? Is that since the anatomy is convoluted and is softer than the instrument, uh, it, it stretches. So uh, by design, the colonoscope stretches the tissue to advance. Uh, this stretching of tissue causes pain uh, and so colonoscopy is so painful that most of colonoscopies are um, performed under full anesthesia, which has a lot of issue in terms of uh, risks. So uh, risk from anesthesia is the highest risk in colonoscopy. And also in terms of time, because the patient needs to be driven to the hospital, need to be sedated, uh, anesthetized before the procedure, and then needs to wake up after the procedure and then need to be driven back home. Uh, and so it's, it's also uh, a cost uh, for the passion and, and the system in general. Uh, flexible endoscopy is also unintuitive. So the user interface is really terrible in terms of uh, ergonomics. Um, so that means that there is a long training needed uh, to perform proficiently a colonoscopy. And uh, the instrument itself is quite expensive. So it, it's, it makes sense to be reused. Of course, it doesn't make sense as a disposable. The price is about $60,000 uh, just for the instrument. And so uh, it needs to be clean after each procedure. And cleaning happens with a glorified washing machine that is only available in, in large centers. So um, having a colonoscopy in a rural area is very difficult and so the patient has to travel if, if the patient lives in a rural area uh, of the country needs to travel to a measured center to get a colonoscopy uh, and so there are a lot of these problems and many others but uh, it would be great to have something that is uh, painless intuitive to use 
and also cheap, so that can be like single user, doesn't need to be reprocessed. And so um, robotics tried to help in this, and this is a review paper from an, another group that analyzed several uh, robots developed for robotic colonoscopy. Out of all those robots, the only one which is FDA approved is this one. Uh, it's called, uh, it's from a company called Endotics and works as an inchworm uh, with two clampers and an elongated, uh, a body that elongates and retracts. So it clamps at the back, elongates the body, clamp at the front, release the back and, and move forward and backward like an inchworm. Uh, despite being FDA approved, uh, it's not replacing colonoscopy for the main reason that it's extremely slow. So to get from the anus to the end of the colon typically gets about four minutes in a conventional colonoscopy. Uh, this robot takes 30 minutes to one hour. So it's really, despite being painless, it's really not fast enough to guarantee the throughput that is needed in, in colonoscopy. And so when I started working in this field, I was at Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Italy, uh, working with in a team that had really like uh, fancy ideas about biomimetics, bioinspiration, and uh, uh, this is the apex of a series of legged capsule robots. Uh, so the first one was four legs, then we built one with eight legs. This has 12 legs, and so it's basically two uh, small motors. Each motor controls a set of six legs, and depending on how we uh, coordinate the gait of uh, the legs, we can move forward or backward and also create space at the same time. So you see, quite small, um, very nice to publish papers, uh, but really I wouldn't uh, use this on myself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if it breaks with the legs open, then you need surgery. Yeah. Not really a great idea. Also, it's very expensive. Uh, fabricated uh, assembled with 72 microfabricated parts. Um, one time we forgot to clean it after an animal trial, it got rusted and we have to throw it away. So it was really, really bad timing. And, but again, nice, nice, nice for my career because we, we wrote a lot of, we were able to publish a lot of paper, but this is not the kind of research I wanted to do. I want to do something that makes sense. Uh, and so we were, this was 2008, so quite some time ago. And this is a younger version of me brainstorming with colleagues in Germany how to, how to, to, to solve the problem. And so we saw this video. Using this magneto, I will now guide the keys of the thorax and out via the frontal face hole. <coughs> That's the storage locker. A boat, the other boat, yeah. and so the idea basically of using a, a permanent magnet to manipulate objects inside the body. And so you see here, I'm trying to do the same stuff as in uh, Futurama there. And uh, uh, at the time, using uh, uh, a passive uh, arm to operate, to, to, to support a permanent magnet. So magnetic fields, well, well, how can we use them to move something inside the body? Uh, so if I have a small magnet inside the body and I have a, a large magnet outside the body, I can apply a force that is proportional to the gradient of the field. So how the, the field varies in space. And I can apply a torque on this small magnet that is a function of the misalignment of the two fields. Um, but what I would like you to appreciate from this slide is how nonlinear is magnetic field in space. And so this poses a problem in terms of control. How can I precisely control something inside the body that I don't see with an external permanent magnet or an external magnetic field? I'll come back to this later. Uh, this is the platform that we set up. And this again was back in uh, 2011, 2012. So robotic arm, permanent magnet, and the flexible endoscope has a permanent magnet at the tip. And uh, this permanent magnet is used for dragging the tip of the endoscope and orienting the camera view. Uh, and so 
we also have, and, and then we have all the other functions of a conventional flexible endoscope. So camera, insufflation, instrument channel, uh, conventional, uh, to, to, to use conventional instruments and so on. Uh, but thanks to magnetic manipulation, we are now applying force and torque at the tip rather than pushing a tube from the distal end. Um, and so here you see the body of the device can be extremely flexible. Uh, and so with this, we assume that this procedure would be extremely, uh, I mean, without pain, really. Um, also, thanks to robotics, we believe we can make it extremely intuitive for the user and also low cost in terms of the, the flexible endoscope really has a magnet, a camera, and some plastic. Uh, and so we can make it disposable or anyway, ultra low cost device. And so with this platform, we went to perform a first comparative trial with conventional uh, colonoscopy. And so we set up uh, uh, anatomical phantom with pig tissue. We placed some markets uh, to simulate tumors and we had the number of uh, clinicians trying the two platform, conventional colonoscopy and robotic colonoscopy. And so we saw that uh, navigation and uh, diagnostic accuracy were comparable. So the, the, all the time we were able to get to the end and see a similar number of lesions, but the robotic procedure was three times lower. Uh, and the reason was that at the time we were controlling uh, with the joystick, the external magnet. And so we were working under the assumption that if, if I move the external magnet, the magnet at the tip of the flexible endoscope was following. Um, and this was true when there was enough space for the tip of the endoscope to move, but that was not always true. Uh, and so to understand that the magnetic coupling was lost, the user had to look at the image, understand that if the external magnet was moving and the internal, uh, the, the view from the camera was not changing, then the external magnet had to uh, be driven back to the previous position and then re-establish magnetic coupling and try different direction. This was extremely frustrating for the user. And so we realized that localization was really an issue there. So we needed a way to localize the tip of the endoscope. And this is the work I did when I moved to Vanderbilt University. And there we uh, basically developed an hardware software approach to have real-time localization of the tip of the endoscope. And so we use a number of magnetic field sensors the, inside the tip of the endoscope, as well as an inclinometer. We measure, with this magnetic field sensor, we measure the field generated by the external magnet at the tip of the endoscope. We rotate it in uh, the same reference frame as the external magnet, thanks to the information from the accelerometer. And then we search, a, uh, we, we perform a search in a pre-calculated magnetic field map to find the position of the, the tip should have to read that magnetic field. And in this way, we are able to localize position and orientation of the tip uh, in a large workspace at one kilohertz uh, a refresh rate with a decent localization accuracy. And so now that we have position and orientation, we can then control uh, the tip of the endoscope in an intuitive way. Uh, so for example, here, we have uh, the user looking at the camera in the camera reference frame, and then with the joystick inputting down, up, left, right, and the system localize the tip, understand how to move the external magnet to implement the user intent. So this is the first level of uh, robotic assistance. And it really makes robotic colonoscopy same experience, similar experience to driving a car in a video game. So you see here the user looks at the image from the camera and with the joystick is controlling uh, the tip of the endoscope rather than the external magnet. And so in this case, we had uh, uh, 10 users, five repetitions each user to navigate this anatomical simulator from anus to cecum. Uh, and we had 100% of success in an average time below 40. And so this was really encouraging a result for us. Um, 
we were also interested in automating tasks, so task automation. And here we automate the task of retroflexion. So basically from looking forward to looking backward. And this is something that thanks to the flexibility of our system, we are able to, to do. So conventional colonoscopy can only retroflect in the first part of the column in the rectum and sometimes at the sepum, but cannot really retroflect in the middle of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and here you see that basically uh, at the push of a button, we localize where the tip of the endoscope is and we understand how to uh, rotate the external, uh, how to basically handle the external magnet to rotate the tip of the endoscope. And what it takes is just about 10 seconds. And this can help with finding tumors that are hidden behind tissue folds. Uh, we also automated the uh, um, biopsy targeting. So uh, when we uh, reach the end of the cecum, we enter in diagnostic modality. And so in that modality, as the user pull the tether, the robot is following the tip uh, just to maintain control over the tip. If a target is visualized, um, then the tip of the endoscope look at the target from two different angles, understand what is the distance from the tip to the target, and then basically align the point where the instrument would come out to the target. And once this is aligned, uh, we have closed loop control of uh, uh, the tip of the endoscope to stabilize while the operator is manipulating the instrument. And so in this case, this is typically a two people procedure, endoscopist and nurse, uh, which can be uh, made by one single person because the system is basically uh, aiming the tip of the endoscope in a very stable way to get uh, to get to the target. Um, this is a spin out, a sort of spin out of our platform. In this case, we added two micro ultrasound transducer at the side. And so micro ultrasound is very high frequency, so about 20 megahertz, able to resolve very small fissures in the, in the mucosa of the colon. And uh, in this case, um, we work on the ultrasound intensity, ultrasound signal intensity. And we saw that if the ultrasound signal intensity was above a threshold, we had a stable echo. And so we were able to reconstruct uh, a, a, an image thanks to also the localization that we have. And so in this case, you see that basically once we get a, a stable echo, we were perturbing the platform and the system was uh, able to restore uh, a, a strong echo. And uh, then we demonstrated the autonomous uh, echo detection and scanning. And in this case is in a simulator with copper wires and uh, and the system was able to do an autonomous scanning. Uh, and then we also demonstrated this in vivo. Um, we introduced the, the, the modified endoscope with the micro ultrasound transducer in a pig. Then we tried to do uh, a manual scanning, which was very difficult. And then we did an autonomous scanning, which went quite well. And we were able to acquire uh, very nice images of different layer of, of, the, of the mucosa, as you can see here. And this can be used for in situ uh, diagnosis of lesions. So instead of getting a tissue sample and sending it to pathology and get the results in two to three weeks, getting uh, a determination if the tissue is cancerous or malignant or not right in situ at the time. Um, Coming back to the original platform without the ultrasound transducer, we also were interested in autonomous colonoscopy. Uh, so in this case, we have a very simple uh, lumen detection algorithm that find the center of the lumen, just looking at the features of the colon. And then the platform is driving the tip towards the center of the lumen. And so this is what we call sort of autonomous driving in, in colonoscopy. Um, and again, in this case, 10 users, five repetitions each, 100% uh, of success in about, again, four, four minutes. 
Um, and then we increase the level of, uh, um, of uh, validation. So this is animal trials. Again, autonomous colonoscopy performed very well. Here you see the trajectory we were able to navigate that we were able to reconstruct thanks to localization. Uh, and then finally, uh, we did human trials at Vanderbilt University in October last year. Uh, and here you see our uh, uh, collaborator, gastroenterology collaborator, Keith Obstin, who has the joystick in one end and with the other end is feeding and the catheter. And here there is a patient. Uh, there was, so the, we had five patients. Uh, they were all undergoing uh, uh, standard of care, so conventional colonoscopy under full anesthesia. And then after conventional colonoscopy was over, we uh, went in with our robotic platform. Anesthesia was uh, ended. And so the patient was basically coming uh, um, back awake while we were during, doing our robotic uh, procedure. And so the patient was able also to give us some feedback, interact with us. So in some cases, we asked the patient to uh, turn on the side or uh, belly up and they were moving by themselves. So, was very, very interesting uh, experience. We will present the results at DDW, Digestive Disease Week uh, in DC in May this year. Um, here you see uh, images from the human trial that are coordinated with localization. And so what we can do with this uh, is basically reconstruct the colon in 3D. Um, and so this is the first example of 3D color reconstruction in a, in a plastic model. But the idea here would be to coordinate, since we have coordination of data with localization and image, we are able to reconstruct in real time the shape of the colon and tell the user if there are blind spots. So if a region of the colon has been missed, has not been visualized, we can tell the user that, and we can make sure that all the colon has been visualized. So we can also like certify a full colonoscopy to the patient. This is something interesting that we are exploring at the moment. Um, so where are we now with this? Uh, we uh, um, we uh, started the company about two years ago. Uh, we got funding from Innovate UK. Uh, that is a, a mechanism that funds startup companies in the UK, plus we also have uh, seed investors, uh, and we were able to raise four million pounds to get FDA approval by 2026. So hopefully, and, and we, are, we are also planning some human trials, uh, so anyone is interested, at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Um, okay, so that's the first part of my talk. Now I'll, I'll transition from a platform where we have one magnet outside the body, one magnet inside the body, two platforms where we have multiple magnets along the length of the catheter and multiple magnets outside. Um, and so the idea here is to control the full shape of the catheter. While for the colonoscopy robot, we were just controlling the tip. Uh, now we want to control the full shape to do, for example, follow the leader uh, navigation and be uh, even more gentle with the anatomy. Um, of course, it's quite challenging scientifically, so it's kind of like basic science for robotics um, because magnetic fields are quite, I mean, homogeneous in, in, in a small workspace. Um, there are other groups working on this, uh, most notably ETH in Zurich, uh, um, and uh, MIT, uh, MIT had a, a magnetic guide wire uh, they developed for neurovascular uh, surgery. And also uh, DIGIST in Korea, University of Twente uh, in the Netherlands, but they are all focusing on steering the T rather than the full body. So that's the main difference for what we are doing. So a first approach was try to understand uh, if we have multiple magnetic elements in the catheter, uh, how should we magnetize them to get a specific uh, shape under an homogeneous magnetic field? So this was the very 
first starting point from our research for our research. So we started from a single magnetic element. We uh, did a finite element modeling and we reconciled the model to, to, to experiments. Once we were happy about the finite element model, we replicated the model three times uh, and used an artificial neural, uh, used this data to train an artificial neural network um, to tell us how to magnetize a tentacle to obtain a specific shape under homogeneous field. Um, then we went and fabricated the tentacles. So you see, this is uh, um, the white part is plain silicon. Uh, the black parts are silicon with magnetic particles. And we have a single axis magnetizer, uh, which is a coil that impose a 1.5 Tesla field to magnetize the, the magnetic particles. And here you see three different tentacles in basically three different trays uh, magnetized so that we can get three different shapes under uh, homogeneous field. Um, and here you see tentacle number one, we apply a field and it gets to this shape. Tentacle number two, we apply the field and get a different shape. And tentacle number three, again, we apply the field and we get a different shape. So that was the idea, using an artificial neural network trained on uh, in silico data to, to, to predict how to, mag to tell us how to magnetize those tentacles. This is a uh, homogeneous field. Then the, the, the other activity we did in parallel was how to generate field and also field gradient to have multiple degrees of freedom. Um, and the original approach, the, the standard approach um, of most of the work in this field is to use coils. So electromagnetic coils um, to generate the field and field gradient. Using electromagnetic coils has the advantage of controlling the current and the current is proportional to the intensity of the field. So it's an additional control in. The downside of coils is that you need very large coils to get forces and torques that are relevant to manipulate devices inside the human body. And so since we like permanent magnets, we like permanent magnets at the end of robotic arms, as I showed in, in the colonoscopy platforms, we try to explore an original way of having two permanent magnets at the end of two robotic arms and see how many degrees of freedom we were able to control. And so in this paper, we went through all the math and then we demonstrated that we are able to control up to eight degrees of freedom in a small workspace. And so this experiment has one permanent magnet here, one permanent magnet here. Each permanent magnet is connected to a load cell. So we have one load cell here and one load cell here. And we basically come close to this workspace from specific direction so that we can actuate one degree of freedom at the time. And so with this, we show that in this small workspace, we have eight independent degrees of freedom. And then we went to use these degrees of freedom for it to do follow the leader introduction. So in this case, we have a motor introducing the tentacle and we want to get to this, to this target, avoiding those two obstacles. And so we, we have a specific magnetization for the tentacle and a specific sequence of actuation that allow us to get to the target, avoiding those two obstacles. Um, so what can we use this for? Um, we thought to use this for uh, getting as far as possible into the lungs. Um, yes. So this is bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy entails the introduction of a flexible endoscope, similar, smaller in size, but similar to colonoscopy. Um, and then from the flexible endoscope, using a tool to get a tissue sample. And so bronchoscopy works very well for the first part of the bronchial tree, uh, when, where the size of the bronchial tree is larger than the flexible endoscope. But then as you go through different bifurcations, the diameter of the, the, the bronchial tree gets smaller and smaller. Um, so typically bronchoscopy is four millimeter in diameters, but very soon you get to the limit. 
of size and the, the, the flexible endoscope cannot progress any further. And then from that point, uh, the, the, the clinician insert the catheter that is guided sort of blindly uh, using preoperative imaging to the point of interest. And so if the point of interest is in a peripheral area of the lungs, this navigation is extremely long, extremely difficult, uh, often happens under fluoroscopy, so with a lot of uh, X-ray for the patient. Um, there are robots to uh, help with this, uh, notably from uh, J&J &J and Intuitive, uh, but those robots are four millimeter, 3.5 millimeter in diameter, so they cannot really go much deeper than a flexible endoscope. Uh, it would be really great to have uh, an instrument, a, a robotic uh, bronchoscope that is like two millimeter in diameter. And this is what we are working on. So the idea of getting to peripheral areas of the lungs with a two millimeter magnetic tentacle. And so in this, uh, in this uh, video here, we, we got CT scan from patient, and then we wanted to do three different navigation. And so we had three differently magnetized tentacles. Um, let me jump to this navigation here. So in this case, we have a tentacle that is magnetized on purpose to get to this uh, branch of the bronchial tree. And you see now it's the, the tentacle is here, is nothing in this direction. And this is the sequence of actuation that get us uh, to, the point, uh, to the point of interest. Um, and so again, we, we went to a more uh, um, anatomically relevant uh, um, validation. And so in this case, we use uh, human lungs, so cadaveric lungs um, to, to validate this approach. And in this case, we get a normal bronchoscope and we introduce the magnetic tentacle from the instrument channel of the bronchoscope. So we go as deep as we can with standard technique and then we deploy the magnetic tentacle. In this case, the magnetic tentacle has two optical fibers. One is a fiber drug grating shape sensor that tell us the shape in real time of the tentacle for uh, controlling purpose, for control purposes. And the laser fiber that can shine uh, energy, uh, laser light, and activate, for example, in this study, we had uh, um, gold nanoparticles uh, for phototermal therapy. Um, and so here you see navigation. So this is the view from the bronchoscope. This is the magnetic tentacle being introduced. This is a, a view from another branch. Um, and this is a bottom view. And in this case, we are still working on, the, on a plastic uh, 3D printed simulator. This is the localization from the uh, fiber bra grating sensor. And we were able to navigate to eight different uh, peripheral regions in about no more than two minutes. So quite, quite fast. Um, once we get to the peripheral end, uh, we were able to shine a laser light. And here we have one sample with gold nanoparticle and one without gold nanoparticle. And this is in this case where we shine light on gold nanoparticle, we see that uh, the increase in temperature is significant uh, despite having a very small optical fiber inside the tentacle. And then we went, as I mentioned, to uh, navigate human lungs. And so under this drape, we have uh, uh, um, lungs from a cadaver. <clears throat> and uh, we were comparing how deep we were able to navigate with a conventional catheter introduced from uh, uh, a, a standard uh, bronchoscope. And here we see that in some cases, we were able to reach much deeper than conventional catheter. In some other cases, we were able to reach the same depth, but with, with our magnetic tentacle, we were not deforming the anatomy. So uh, much gentler uh, with the anatomy and so avoiding also perforation, which is very relevant if we get to the like, periphery of the lung, to the pleura, there we really don't want any perforation. Um, and so, yeah, but concluding on bronchoscopy, where are, where are we this now is that the next step for us is peak triads. So we want to see if you are able to compensate for breathing. 
uh, and uh, heartbeat motion, which is, is really the, the next step here. Um, what also we discovered by studying uh, those magnetic tentacles is that if you have a non-homogeneous magnetization along the length of the catheter, you may not want the shape that you were planning. So for example, um, here we wanted to achieve this U shape, uh, but what was happening when, when we were applying a field, instead of getting this U shape, the tentacle was twisting on itself. And this is because this configuration here has a lower energy than this one. And so the tentacle rather goes in make this motion rather than bending up. Um, and so if we really want the tentacle to bend up, we had to introduce uh, a fiber reinforcement. And so in this case, we had the core um, of braiding, like fiber braiding. And this fiber braiding, what did was increase torsional stiffness. Uh, and so you see like, um, the, the bending was not affected, but the torsional stiffness was affected. And so if we have an unreinforced catheter and a, and a reinforced catheter and we apply a field, the unreinforced catheter just twists on itself, the reinforced catheter get the, the shape we want. What can we use this for? Uh, here, the idea is to get to the pancreas. So, so pancreatic uh, intubation. Again, this is a procedure that happens through a flexible endoscope. So in this case, the flexible endoscope go down to the, to the esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the small intestine. And then if we want to get to the pancreas, um, a, a catheter is, is deployed from the instrument channel. This is a very difficult procedure. And pancreatic cancer, despite not being a huge killer, it's one of the deadliest. So pancreatic cancer, because the pancreas is such, so difficult to reach and so delicate uh, that the technologies are really not there. Um, and so here you see a simulator of the pancreas. So this is the pancreatic duct, and this is the bile duct. And this is a magnetic tentacle reinforced that we design with a specific magnetization to get into the bile duct. Uh, and then the clip will show a um, magnetic tentacle that is designed to get to the pancreatic duct. And so, the magnetization is different depending on the shape that we want. And it's coordinated with the field that we apply during production. And this is possible thanks to the fiber reinforcement. If we have only magnetization at the tip, you see we are able to get to the papilla, to the entrance here, but then the magnetic tentacle doesn't progress any forward. Uh, if we don't have fiber reinforcement, it basically twists on itself and doesn't bend. And so this shows how important is the, the, the braiding for this application. Um, the last thing I'll touch upon is another kind of crazy idea was, okay, we are able now to control a single magnetic tentacle in shape. Can we control two of them to do bimanual manipulation? Uh, and so he, in this case, for example, thinking about base of the skull surgery, having uh, um, a camera at the end of one tentacle and having a laser fiber at the end of another and have like B manual operation. Of course, very counterintuitive because of uh, the magnetic field is very, very, very homogeneous in that workspace. But we know we have about eight degrees of freedom to play with. And so in this case, we had uh, a design of the tentacle, which we call Fusilli, because I mean, we are there are some Italians in my lab and we like pasta. So this design really uh, reminded us of uh, Fusilli pasta. Uh, the idea is to have each segment with a specific magnetization and a specific mechanical reinforcement. Uh, and so you see this helical shape prevents the tentacle to bend in a specific direction. And so by playing with magnetization of each segment and mechanical reinforcement of each segment, we were able to actuate one while keeping the other one steady. So in this case, the two tentacles are like four centimeter apart. And you see here, we are applying a field that 
is moving only one of the two, keeping the other one steady. And we repeated this um, experiment, shortening the distance between them down to two centimeters. And so you see that the, the, the tentacle on the left has a nice workspace, quite symmetrical. Uh, the tentacle on the right does not have a very symmetrical workspace, but still can move on one axis and partially on the other one. Um, so we were quite happy about the results and uh, we mounted a camera on one uh, and uh, a laser lie, a laser fiber in the other one. And we tried to see what we were able to do inside um, a simulator for base of the scalp side. And here you see, this is the view from the camera on one of the tentacle. And this is, we are moving the other tentacle with the laser fiber. And then we were able to, to actuate, to, to shine a laser light uh, to perform navigation, I mean, a motion on a specific uh, uh, pathway that uh, we, we wanted to, to, to perform. So we were able to demonstrate quite independent motion of the two uh, manipulators. What else on magnetic tentacle? We, we have, I mean, this is a big grant, so we have a lot of other stuff that we produce, for example, uh, a simulation environment based on material point method, which is a method typically used in gaming industry to simulate in real time the, the, the motion of our magnetic tentacles. We work on real time localization of magnetic tentacles based on magnetic field sensing. We work on closed loop control. So basically with fiber bra grating inside the tentacle, uh, controlling uh, uh, the motion in closed loop fashion. Um, we also have a work on changing stiffness of the tentacle to perform manipulation of objects. And finally, we studied uh, if we can uh, reduce friction of uh, motion inside the lumen by rotating magnetic. It's, of course, these are all works that we publish, but I don't have time to, to, to discuss in detail. Happy to answer questions if you are interested. What is next in this area of research? Yes, stiffness control is something interesting. So we want to stiffen the body and just move the tip uh, for certain type of operations. We are trying to push the limit of fabrication down to millimeter. Uh, below millimeter scale in diameter using aerosol jet printing. And then we want to do animal triads with, uh, especially bronchoscopy, to cope with respiration and heartbeat compensation. I think that's it. Of course, big thank to all the, all the funding agencies, including NIH, who is still funding our human triads for robotic colonoscopy. Uh, big thank to the European Research Council that funded all the, all the research in uh, magnetic tentacles. And this, uh, thank you for your attention and happy to get questions. Thank you, Pietro. I think, um, Guichu, you're going to have a mic for the audience here in person. Sai, you're going to monitor online. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, um, Guichu, you want to take a mic up? Uh, do you have an AI diagnostic classifier for automated fault detection and localization? Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. So our platform is fully compatible with AI system for polyp detection. So, for example, if, if we want to plug, plug in the GI Genius from Metronic, it's just sort of plug-in. Uh, but we didn't want to develop our own because there are many already available. So um and sorry, and just one second question. Uh in the bronchoscopy, um you used gold nanoparticles. I was wondering um if you um, if you use like iron nanoparticle uh, iron particles um something magnetic, could you essentially uh, um you know position the particles for the heat treatment uh, via the external magnets? 
Um, okay, so the idea of using those gold nanoparticles was to functionalize them. So the collaborator, uh, the collaborator in, in the School of Physics, they have uh, functionalized gold nanoparticles that only bind with, with tumor cells. So the idea is to inject the, the gold nanoparticles that go around and they only bind with the tumor. Um, we can also guide them with magnetic fields. Yes, yes, that's, that's another option. Make its way over there. Sai, let me know if there's any online questions that pop up. Thank you for the talk. I'm curious how, if you've looked into how the external magnetic actuation of some of these like catheter devices might be affected by people who have implants with some sort of metallic components. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So um, for the human trial, we have the exclusion criteria that are the same as MRI. So uh, if you have metallic implant, you cannot get an MRI, and that's the same for us. Um, interestingly, we went to do the human trials uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, the human trials were on two, five patients on two days. On a Thursday, we had one patient, and then the other four on a Friday. And on Thursday, the anesthesiologist that we were planning to work with, she was away for some reason. The substitute at the pacemaker. And so the very first in human, we entered the room and said, the, the patient is fine. We have selected a patient without the implant, but the anesthesiologist has a pacemaker. And so I remember myself like <laughs> shielding the magnet from the anesthesiologist. But uh, in the end, uh, the magnetic field uh, is decays so rapidly uh, that the pa pacemaker line uh, is very close to the magnet. So as long as people with implants stay away, uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's also true that new implants are magnetically, um, they, they don't interact with magnetic fields anymore. So I think in the future, we will be able to do a colon magnetic colonoscopy on every patient. But for the moment, we have the same exclusion criteria. Yeah. Yeah, really great to talk. Um, super impressive work. Uh, have you uh, considered or worked on integrating imaging data? So some of these patients will have had, say, CTs of their abdomen. Some will actually show masses. Um, there's also CT interrography where you know they can have a screening test and it can show you where a mass might be. Can you use that to sort of guide your your um, robots uh, any more precisely? So for colonoscopy, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't thought about integrating that. For bronchoscopy, yes. For bronchoscopy, the idea is to have a, a CT scan before the, the navigation to pre-plan, uh, and possibly, if, if needed, a C-arm to guide the procedure. But so for bronchoscopy, yes. I mean, the colon, we, I mean, is, is moving a lot, right? So it's difficult to, to have a, pre, a meaningful pre-planning with uh, preoperative imaging. Uh, certainly, with our localization, we can tell where for example, where we have taken a biopsy or that can be related to the to the path that we have navigated. But of course, the colon is moving all the time with peristalsis, so rearranging itself. So not sure if it makes sense. Yeah. The mic helps the online audience hear your question, so. Fair enough. Um, have you uh, considered applying your approach to endovascular procedures? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Yes. So uh, actually, in the grant, the grant proposal, one big chunk was cardiovascular procedures. Uh, in practice, we didn't yet. Uh, we were. Uh, I mean, that that was even more by opportunity and by clinical collaborators. So we were successful in finding uh, 
uh, cardiothoracic surgeon interested in bronchoscopy, um, a, a, a clinician interested in pancreatic cancer. So the answer is not yet, but of course, yeah, it, it, it could work in cardiovascular. That's a good question, Pietro, for the um, uh, bronchoscopy. You showed like the ABC targets. Does that require a different catheter based on the magnetic approach? Yeah. And yeah, so then yeah. do you have like basically template catheters or would you need to prefabricate catheters for every patient based on target? So the, the original idea we started from was personalizing the catheter for each navigation. So even like a single patient, if we want to get to a specific point, have a specific catheter. And that was the first work we did. Um, but then the second work, the one in, in cadaveric lungs, we saw that basically we can have templates and simplify this. And so with the same template, we can reach certain configurations. And so this simplifies things. But yeah, the original idea was like to print them and personalize them to the specific application. Thank you for this talk. I have a quick question about the magnetic fields that you've been applying. So even with two magnets, you're still ensuring that you have a non, uh, sorry, a uniform external magnetic field? Not really necessarily uniform because we, we, uh, we use both the um, misalignment of the field for uh, uh, orienting uh, orientation, but also we we work with gradient for traction for applying forces. So it's 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 not an homogeneous field. I guess the question, the follow-on question is: Have you considered introducing some degree of nonlinearity right to the radiant field? Because that potentially gives you additional degrees of freedom. That is, yes, that's what we're. Line Sai, go ahead. Yeah, we basically started. So the, the first the first work I showed was homogeneous field, but then we with the two magnets we are we are now playing with with gradient as well. Right, so there's one question that's asked online, and it's about what medical robotics domain, in your opinion, would show significant production level technology. Which domains are most significant? Uh, so, so like they're asking about what medical robotics domain, in your opinion, would be showing significant production level technology. Um, so, I mean, we were discussing with them before about bronchoscopy is quite saturated with robotic platforms. So maybe not bronchoscopy, although I'm working on bronchoscopy. But uh, I think like getting as deep as possible inside the body with precision is something that is not possible at the moment. For example, like reaching the pancreas is something I'm very excited about. I think it would be interesting to get to the small intestine in a non-invasive way, but that would allow us to study the microbiome. I think that is nice. That would be, so a way that basically a patient can go to a clinic get samples from different areas of the small and large intestine for microbiome studies, but without needing full anesthesia, which makes things impossible. So I think that, that would be it. Context, the small bowel currently is inaccessible to us. Like you can't get to most of the small bowel right now unless you undergo an operation and we put a hole in it to go look around in it. Um, so that's a fair point. And actually the pancreas point, I see some of the surgical residents are here, but that came up actually in our morbidity and mortality conference a couple of weeks ago, because it's such a small duct that getting to the end of it is very difficult. And we have a saying in surgery, it's don't F with the pancreas, because if you manipulate and you're too traumatic inside of that, you cause pancreatitis and that in and of itself can kill the patient. Um, so there's a lot of issues. Um, as, um, as we're waiting, just in case anybody else has any other questions, I had a question that's I think more general and we kind of touched on it a little bit at breakfast, but I often have students from C's come over and they ask me, they're like, oh, I want to do something that has medical applications. How do you identify medical applications that are worth creating engineering solutions around? Is it that the clinician says, here's a place of need, or is it that you observe their work and realize ah, what you're doing is really antiquated and we can engineer you out of this problem? That's a, that's a very good question. So 
Of course, I mean, reading papers is, is crucial. So what I tell students is make a very thorough state of the art search. Uh, my as an engineer, my experience with clinicians is that they tend to have single view. So, I mean, you can have, a, I, mean, I don't want to have many clinicians in the room, but uh, oh, this is the need. So uh, I can, I can tell you a little story. When I was starting at Vanderbilt, trying to establish collaboration with clinicians, uh, I got, uh, I met um, a bariatric surgeon. I mean, bariatric surgery in 2011 was big. Um, and so I was excited for this meeting. But then this guy come, come and it was a kind of short guy. And he said, oh, you are a robotist. You need to um, build for me a robotic platform that I can control with my voice and would lift me up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> is this really relevant? I don't know. But for this guy was really, and so I, we need to double check a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't, but, but so that's why I, I uh, so my suggestion to students is uh, always go to see such as, uh, procedures. I, I, and I'm, I'm glad uh, that in Leeds we have this big hospital, but that was the same at Vanderbilt. So I send them to the operating room and have them seeing the procedure. This is really extremely uh, useful, as well as attending uh, clinical conferences uh, to get like, uh, an average feedback, uh, to, to average the feedback. Um, any other questions from anybody? I know we're coming up on time. I may have a, some question. Uh, it's a great journey translation from finding experiment to animal and the human. Uh, during these transitions, is there any uh, evaluation matrix about the safety, for example, like force or something, or just doctors say, yes, we can do the transition yeah, like that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, so the human trials here, they were approved by the um, Vanderbilt IRB, so the local ethical committee. So we didn't go to FDA, or, uh, but still we had to perform all the uh, safety checks that, I mean, we wanted to perform all the safety checks as this was going to be a product. So we did bio burden, um, electrical compatibility, um, forts, of course, a lot of uh, testing uh, magnetic forts. So, for example, the, the, the magnetic coupling is designed in a way that even if the tip of the endoscope is as close as possible to the external magnet, uh, the pressure you get would not be armed at all. So, it's in a, a, a inherently safe platform. Because the, the worst you, it can happen, you, you, you don't, you lose the magnet. And so that's why we believe we can convince FDA in general, even for autonomous, because it's something that cannot really pro produce any harm. But yeah, no, it's it's important, of course. And uh, animal trials, uh, this is something that in Europe, uh, they're really making our life hard with animal trial. But for us, we, we need animal trial. We need to show safety before going to human. So it's, it's a fight that the, the ethical approval, I'm struggling, but uh, here is mine. Well, I don't want to delay lunch. Um, so thank you very much um, for coming all this way. I really appreciate it. And I think you're going to join us for lunch. So for anybody else who has more sort of one-on-one -on -one questions, um, Professor Valdosti is going to be outside with uh, with pizza. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.